today's lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, maps in the brain. So the maps is a uh, topographic maps. Um, there's something wrong with the microphone. So that's on. Oh, sorry. All right, it's better. So we talk about taking map in the brain. So the topogra topographic means that uh, the things that are similar are close to each other in the brain, right? So just it preserves uh, the, the the topology. As you know, it is a science about the uh, preserving the neighborhood relationship. Right? The things in the neighborhood, you have a transformation that preserve that relationship. <coughs> so there are examples in the visual system, there's some the sensory system, auditory system. Um, and also there are also motor maps. You know, sometimes the motor action is also mapped in a topographic manner. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, one computational model, uh, the self-organizing map. It is more abstract, but it, but it captures some essential purpose of how these type of orderly maps can be developed starting from something very random. So the video system, of course we all know, we just talk about this map. So uh, an image in a space project on the back of your eye, you all well know that, it goes to the thalamus, right? because all information from the cortex has to pass to the thalamus, except for the olfaction, right? And then you project the back of the visual cortex. But this map is a preserved uh, topographic information. So this is, this is an early example, which the, so the diagram on the top, this is a visual field. So basically, they have the stimulus here, just like a black and a white dot, they are just flickering around. Right? They basically just have a, just, it looks like a polar corner system of these spots, the active spots. All the background is a stationary gray background. Right? So this is a piece of the primary visual cortex. And those dark spots are those parts which the part of the cortex that's activated. Right? The basically this case, this is an early, this is not the image, it's an early example. You basically see how the energy is, you need some kind of glucose in this area, so they use like a radioactive, it's a very early example, to identify the location where the cell is the most active. So you can see there are similarities, activity pattern on the cortex similar to this. So this you see, this is only as you know, the half of the visual field is uh, left, left hand, uh, the left side, the half of the visual field is mapped map to the uh, left part of the brain, right? so, so the part is in reverse. So the, you look at the relationship more closely, what uh, the transformation looks like this. So basically, uh, these lines here, is, so it's a different, you know, the polar chronic system, uh, these, basically the radius is called the eccentricity. Right? It's called the this is one degree uh, from the center, the two on the you know, two, two point three degrees, the five point four degrees, so on. So these three lines basically uh, is just uh, these lines right? uh, in, in the cortex. But this correspond to to the you know, polar corner system would be the semicircle, or the, the, it's like a circle, the semicircle. Right? So now they are looks almost like a parallel lines. So the radial directions. Uh, the different angle, uh, these different angles correspond to these different things. So this, let me see what uh, can read. This is a, a plus 90 degree here, would be the up here, right? So this line, horizontal line, uh, equivalent to horizontal line, right? So this ne ne negative 90 degree would be equivalent to this. So you basically flip upside down and so distort it. Right? But it preserves a neighborhood relationship. The two points that are close in the visual field, they also end up close in the, in the cortical, you know, the physical space in the cortex. And it's not, of course, it's not, it's not uniform. You see that the fovea, that's what I'm talking about here in this space, according to this point here, it's overrepresented. I think this is a general rule. In the cortex, Anything that's important to you, usually you have to devote more area in the cortex to represent something important. Uh, some people like Schwartz, they, they, they study this map and say that this sort of a similar to a conformal mapping. So I think, I think most of you have not taken the class like complex analysis. The conformal map is basically it is sort of angle-preserving uh, transformation. So if you do this, so this is a 
half of the circle, right? It's a you know, radio corner system. If you take a log of that number, so this number here, z, is a, of course a complex number, it's not just not a scalar. <laughs> so basically, any function, a continuous function, you know, like a normal function, like a, a, a real function, you can extend it to a complex domain. So the difference is just that it maps the two, two variable, which is, you know, you can plot each complex number as a point on the complex plane of x, y, right? It's like it's just a real part versus an uh, imaginary part. And then, once you apply some function, analytical function like this, like this is log, uh, the output also is complex number. It's, a, it's, a, it's another point on the plane. So if you take the log, some, adding some number, then you, you, you look like this. It's sort of where it lo look visually kind of similar. So this particular transformation is, is angle preserving in the sense that if you look at the locally, so you use um, the same eccentricity or the same orientation, uh, they you know intersect at the right angle, that's so an identical angle locally. Right? But you go to here, you know, the shape is distorted with angle if it's a 90 degree, it's still 90 degree. So it preserves the angle. So for, for this for the it's generally the complex function. You only change the orientation and amplitude it only change the angle. It's basically there's no shear. So. <coughs> um, so some people notice that maybe this because um, this geometric transformation uh, you can explain some maybe visual hallucination. So this is a this artist rendition of what they saw when they got like a, some hallucination. So you can introduce this hallucination with some kind of a drugs, right? Some kind of or some people get it and they're really sick and they see this too. It's a good sign. <laughs> so in this case it's typical, you know, there are many different, you know, patterns. Some are more complex, some of this hallucination is just simple, like this geometric pattern like this. So like this radio pattern, or a spiral pattern, and that's typical. So the interesting thing is this. So if you, you know, consider uh, the cortex. So these are the cortex, or these are the visual field. Here it showed two of them because we just said you know, when a half of the visual field goes to half of the cortex, right? Here it is a plot of both. So it turns out that based on the geometry of transformation, if you have a radio line here in the visual field, in the cortex it will be almost like a straight line. And if you look at this map here, so basically, all the radial curves have become these curves. If, you, if it's a real logarithm, it's exactly all parallel. It becomes a rectangular curve. But because you have added a small number here, there's a little, you know, there's a little singularity there. Um, it's not really singularity. It's a little focus here, right? So, and the interesting thing is that if you see this all the spiral stuff like this, if you just based on the same transformation, it goes backward. Uh, these all the all these spiral lines become a parallel line, but in you know, this oblique direction. So the reasoning was that if um, the visual hallucination is something, anything you see right, in your mind, it must correspond to something in the brain, that's happening in the brain. Right? That's that's assumption, you need, the basic assumption of neuroscience. Right? <coughs> so the hallucination you see, there must be correspond to some activity in the, in the, in the visual system. So if you Suppose activity in the cortex, it, it, you can really easy to imagine. You, you, you already see some example in your homework that you can generate like a traveling bomb activity pretty, very easily, right? In the, in the two-dimensional space, we, we didn't talk about it, it's possible to generate this kind of you know, parallel kind of activity launch. Right? So, so the idea is that if that's the case, right, in, in the visual cortex, you're able to generate this kind of a parallel band of activity and using and traveling around you know, the cortex. In that case, depend on the orientation of these lines, if they are sort of oblique direction, and in a visual field, it correspond to some stimulus that look like a spiral. Right? And in this case, if they are you know, parallel horizontally, then it will be like something like a radio kind of like this. So these are different of these things will correspond to different of these parallel lines. Right? So this is kind of, I thought, kind of an interesting thing that based on this geometric relationship. Maybe it's easy to generate. It's hard to maybe the spiral. Pattern. I don't know. Maybe maybe you can generate. You know, actually, there are evidence you can generate in the spiral pattern in, 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 the, in, the, in the cortex. But the parallel line is very easy to generate. But the, if that's the case, then you can explain some of the geometric uh, hallucination. This is a, a very early early work about this. Um, so this. We learned before that the bigger system is manually taking 
are several. As I said. Um, so this is just a monkey. So maybe the humans are different. They are different from other animals. Yeah, well, actually, if you look at the visual system, actually very similar to a monkey. If you measure people's like psychophysical threshold, how how accurately can you see different lines? How how fine they are distinction? Uh, the visual is kind of very similar to a to a macaque monkey, so based on the measurement. So you look at the visual cortex in human. This is a sort of functional imaging. So what do you see here? This is a piece of uh, visual cortex, right? Um, so the stimulus is shown in, the, in this thing here. It's like a, a, a small segment of the movie and something like that kind of happening. So the idea is that you see the activity in the cortex. When that thing moves, depending on the orientation of the stimulus, there's different activity. So the white stuff is like the parts in the, in the cortex are the most active. This is measured by functional magnetic imaging. So principally, presumably, this is a non non non. You can see, if there's a single visual map, right? And V1, then you only see, you should only see like a single white band. Right? There are many different white bands. Right? So that means you can know the white place, that means that all, they all correspond to this activity along the sector. As you, you can lock at different times to see what's, uh, what's in the presentation, so different angles right, of the orientation. And you can do a complementary study. So this one is going uh, to show that Thing. This is a sort of like a ring, like an expanding ring. So it's basically polar common system. One is the, the, the angle, the other is the radius. Then you see activity going on too. So based on that, you can so each of the <coughs> you can map you can map each complete map that is a visual field is correspond to one visual area. So this is the way you can actually see in human have this function of visual area. It look like one thing. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. And they have V1. Uh, V2, V3, V4, and MT, and so on. So it's especially interesting, for example, you know, MT is an area it's devoted to remember from it's what? It's a, it's a visual motion. And they care about motion. They don't care about the color and form much. Some other area, like a V4, uh, they care about form, color, and other stuff. They don't care about motion much. So there, there are many different areas that you can, you know, the human can see the same. So this is basically uh, Human, a living human, right? And this is sort of inflate. You assume this is sort of made of plastic, uh, made of a rubber, and you inflate it you can, so you can see the area in the, in the sulcus. Uh, this is like a flattened map, so just you can see the. the <laughs> look at it, you look at this like a monkey, kind of similar. Like this map. So this is V1, this is V2, so on. Right? Some resemblance. <coughs> Um, so there's a little bit, this is just like a topographic location. Right? As you know, there are more dimensions than just this XY location. There's a protocol system, which is basically two-dimensional space. Right? The real dimension is more than two. So another dimension you know is called ocular dominance. It's a bit, where do you see the concept? On that side, the right side. Right? So in the cortex, information is actually mixed. But in this map, this is a piece of cortex, you can from above, it's a piece of cortex, so different areas have diff they care, they like different orientation. Right? <coughs> okay, there are, there are how many dimensions? There are, uh, it's uh, so the two, the, the retinal copy, the, the retinal location, that's two, that, that's a surface, a two dimensional map, okay? But besides that, in each location, Depending on the orientation of the signal, the different neurons devote to the different orientation. Right? So, the, so there are another two, there is another a third dimension in or, this orientation for, for, the, for the local bar of the orientation. And there also is a, another dimension. This is sort of a, it's the, where you can come from. It's the left side of the right side. So, 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 so you see, you have the multi-dimensional space. You want to map it on a two-dimensional space. Can you do that continuously? The dimension is a topological property. That means if I do this portion with the computer, there's no way to map the state of code and then some similarity, some structures, some discontinuity. That's very cute, otherwise, not possible. So, this local area, you see the cells would be like different options. I didn't find some kind of mathematics, but in this case, uh, if you look over the, the, the different maps, so this is a uh, 
these are iso orientation, okay? So basically the same line of the cell, they have the same orientation, the same color. Uh, so these dark stuff over here, these are the ocular dominant columns. So basically the, the darkened area, slightly darkened area is driven by one eye, so the other area, the lighter area driven by the other eye. So very interesting So, um, and you can notice some stuff like this. This will blow up some locally. You see that some, you know, these are, you know, cells with the same orientation, right? These are cells with the same orientation. So this point, this is a singularity. At this point, uh, they have cells with all different orientations and conversions. It's the same location. Uh, this thing happens a lot of times. You can see the lot of locations here. These are all these equal pinwheel, and all this use singularity. Many of them. Uh, in recent years, I'm sure you learned this that um, we can record single node. Uh, because that optical image is that an image. Very, the resolution is not, not very high. You basically, the different colonies average activity in, in the neighborhood. This average activity in many neurons. So these are the two photon units that you can see in the video cell. So in this map, I think that each point here is one cell, right? So then you can see in the video cell, and then you can measure the same thing. It has a different orientation by which cell So now you can see the pinwheel over here on this kind of cru the crude map. It's very really equivalent to a single cell. Right? It's a very, <laughs> very individual. It's like, I really have a cellular resolution. Okay. So this just like shows that the, the map is this. The map is this. The cell has a different one. So these are just very low level things. What about the higher level stuff? Like this is the uh, map. Uh, but, um, you know, high level visual cortex. We have a learning of this lecture, they care about other kind of features, like you know, shapes are much more complex. Sometimes we care about faces, like so this. And even, you know, for the faces, really, they can, even different face of different view may be represented by different locations. But there's, you know, uh, <coughs> another, uh, this, is, this is like a imaging study, right? There's, there's many, there's a head, a different orientation. You see the activity spots, the hot spot on the cortex at different locations. You plug them together. As the face rotates, like activity actually like move around like a bump continuously. Right? There's different parts. The main is that there's a map of the of this face in different locations in the cortex. These are just different examples that give you idea that really the there is a tendency in the cortex. It tends to represent similar information by the, you know, the same neighborhood. Even though there are distortions, discontinuity, single variable, those things are expected if you try to map a high dimension, high dimension space on a two dimensional surface. Right? There is no way it can be continuous everywhere. And also, um, there, there, there are also there are multiple maps, not just the same one. There are multiple, you can do many times. So, the switch here is essentially the system. This is a very familiar with. Right? This is a homunculus, so and this is a cortex. Right? Right? It's sort of, we look at this, it sort of a preserve the color of the face, in the high near close to and not exactly, so this is not really a real face, it's a real face. We have this rough layout of the upper body. We represent, you know, for us, it looks very big, right, because it's a sensitive system. Finger, you know, big thumb, so it's very, very really unusual, you know, it's the feet are very small, right? It's, it's harder to play soccer, and I think it's not very good like that. And you see what's next to it. I mean, some stuff is it's bad pitch or something. I don't know whether it's like a uh, yeah. yeah, look at the lung. This also this is this is just like a making uh this is there are many areas of sensory to as well, multiple areas. So uh, yeah, so this is a Animal, they just usually people find out this in the beginning, you know, by human, you then put electron in different parts of the cortex, you know, touch an animal.
some type of body and topographic map and locally And you look at this cortex, this, 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 the barrel cortex, a lot of group of cells, you can even see this visually in a different bunch, eh? the different one, two, three, four different rows. So each of the, the, the cluster of cells here push down to each individual. It's like for us, it's different bits. Different but here, really, in each individual whisker, they have a corresponding structure in the in the So this is another. So the auditory system is another example. <coughs> this is a fact. So we mean, why all know that? And they can base on some like a, a flat or a little fine structure from the uh, uh, But for this animal, it's very hard to imagine. For example, if your system feels like uh, different, it's just like audition. Some people are blind, they can use echo, yeah. and can generate some sound. It's based on echo, they try to figure out what it is. But it's still a good idea. Or it could be, it could be a visual, where you can see things. Right? But in this case, you can see that in the a, in a cortex, uh, there is a large representation of a, of a particular frequency. I think this frequency is this uh, the frequency of the because this is echolocating band. They right? generate some sound actively. This is the active sensing system, and there are, there are different harmonics. So basically, you represent that frequency a huge you know, chunk of what that is then by frequency generated by itself, and there are different harmonics or representing. This means
This was discovered by David Robinson, who actually uh, Johns Hopkins and I think many of the It's very important in the unfolding of the past. So it's basically, this is the surface of one security history of the two. Um, if you stimulate some part, you know, perhaps uh, it will, the eye will move. So the move is based on the arrow, so it will go in one direction. So basically, if, if you stimulate here, this corresponding like, uh, like origin, which is not going to happen. If you move away, from there, you enter the gravity, the, the, the movement enters the gravity. So basically, we have this kind of map. So each point on the map means the direction of a movement relative to a current. Based on the current position of the movement, so that, so that vector is represented at the two dimensional thing. That's represented explicitly on the surface of this. The story actually is not possible. This vector defined here, they move toward that vector. So, so this is a very really good algorithm. But for the motor, There's a lot of math in the That's one thing. You will see the map a lot. It's a very good function in the same way. This is self-organizing. I 
Basically, the output could, uh, this is so supposed to be a sort of neighborhood function. So what it means is that if I Then you update the learning group based on multiple functions. This is a Gaussian function. The center on this I star G star is the location of that limit where there is the loudest. And so basically this measures the distance uh, from any cell IJ to that limit. So if the distance is small, so you know, close to zero, so this exponential function, so this is like a Gaussian function, right? It, 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 it's close to one. If it, when the difference, in, uh, the difference, difference, uh, the distance increases, this, mon this function drops monotonically, approaching zero. For any cell that's far away from that limit, right? so this h liberal function would be close to zero. Nothing happens, and you don't change the weight. So you change the weight only when you are close to that limit. When you try to close by the winner, so this learning rule is going to look like a dirt of the x relative to the weight. So basically you make your 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 weight, you update your weight, so your weight will become a closer to, to, to your to your input. That's a little bit strange, right? Because in this case you see the input and the x is like a dirt. Why do I use this? So this is this is this is the idea that I'm sure. So this is basically um, suppose you normalize your input. Vector. I only care about the direction here. Absolute magnitude doesn't matter here. They're all normalized. The lens are interesting that. Yeah. So the distance, the difference between us input and, the, and that weight, the square, based on the, the, the dot product, just spells out, right? So equal to this, because we, we assume the vector length is uh, conserved, true, right? We have this cross product. So basically, to minimize this difference between the weight and the input is the same as you minimize the because the negative sign is equal to maximize the overlap. Right? The two vectors maximize the overlap. Right? So basically, you, the idea of this learning is that you update, you need to update, you want to make your weight such that it's, uh, it's closer to that. Right? So Once you update the weight, the weight close by becomes similar. The cell you know, you know, becomes similar. <coughs> so this is a common case. In this case, we start the function. So each 
circle here, this is the this is the same white cell. Okay, we put on the same cell. So every cell we see bunch of neutral material that's seen in the region, same as the other way to every cell. This cell is characterized by the what's wrong with it? Let's say by chance, in this case, we started learning. We started learning, and suppose this loop was in this direction, in this direction, right? And then, if so this cell happens to have a random you know, vector, you know, which happens to match this, 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 this closer to mine. That means among all these cells, so this seems to be this cell which can give out the fixed output because it's the Now you need learning. Some, some cells learn this way, sometimes you learn up the direction of the sound you learn. But it's a big question, but after you learn many times, it's time to move ahead. You get a new thing, it's a new thing. So these are the examples. What they show here that each point on the wrist here needs to be back. So eventually after learning all this is then so that you so that you get the problem. Look at the backboard, see what that cell was as you were in the beginning. The beginning of the loop is small, the beginning of the loop is always small. The one that you get is going to be all right here. Thank you. No, it's not possible. It's one dimension, and no way you can feel a two dimension. But it tries to, you know, preserve some topology by your trying to do the space. Um, you can do things that are more complex. Uh, <coughs> this is a pool. Um, in this case, um, you represent your inputs as more attractive animals, right? For each animal. Of course, we all show the input of different vectors, right? So whether above, they put uh, some feature, a feature space, it's a small, medium, or big, so the dog is small. Right? Two legs, four legs, uh, hoofs, maze, feather, so on. Uh, it has two legs, has feather, and tail, tail. So these are just like a left to hum, to run, to fly, swim, and just swim, like to fly. So this is dog, right? So for each animal, you have a, um, the vector, the feature vector, right? it's like a high dimensional vector that represents this animal. And uh, additional, they have additional input and not show for identity of the animal. So basically, for each animal, there's something special about that animal, and there's additional math for each, each, each animal. 
So you use this kind of input, and you use a self-organizing line in the beginning, so that you have a bunch of weights to weight each of the features. So I see in the, in the beginning, some random cell will be activated during this learning cycle. Thing, right? So the idea is that uh, eventually, when you look after learning, so each of the point here is one cell. Right? Then you just say, I, if I show the dog, you know, which cell is the most activated, then the dog is actually turned out to be the cell the most active dog is here. You just plot this map this way. So the plotting is slightly different. The idea is similar, but it just show it a different way. So you can imagine if you have this self-organizing map. Afterwards, you see these cells you like dog most. Right? You, you, you use dog as an input, a bunch of a bunch of features. You know, this cell is the most active. This all will be most active. So you see this is a very high dimensional space. But on this two dimensional space, what you can see is that the, the the similar animal there in the input, all these animals here, they're all sort of birds, they all can fly, they all kind of birds. So these are all, what is this? Right? These are, have, this is a, has hoofs, right? These are sort of more, more like a predators, a different animal. So that idea that, you know, the inputs, in all, in all cases, the similar inputs eventually will end up in a similar location in the cortex, right? So these inputs, it's, it's not, it's very high dimensional, but, you know, it turns out you can, Cluster six based on this kind of model. <coughs> Any questions? Yes? Okay. All right, so for the plasticity, you know, what is the evidence? I just see the last slide, just talk a little bit. So there are many evidence that the, the maps can be changed. Of course, for children, it's very easy to learn new things, but for, for us, it's harder. Um, but even for adults, the cortex still can be changed. So these are examples. Uh, this is for monkeys, is a long finger, very long. On this tip of finger, right, this experiment, uh, what we know, you have representation of different fingers, right, one, two, three, so the five digits of finger represent on the cortex of, it, of, of the monkey. And the tip of the second, this is the tip of two, I think, is this, this, this area, and then this tip of finger. Right. What they do is that they only, uh, every day, just only for, I don't know how many, maybe, maybe 10 minutes, it's just a few minutes. I just tapped in on the fingertip, and they tap on the fingertip, just a train or just or something. It's, it's not very really hard. Like play piano with one finger. And they play like kind of very small on time. Then after a couple of months, I think that's weeks and months, or 10 months, then you should measure the cortex. See this, you should take the finger and it must be large. So this is an adult animal. So, so basically, you can change the representation. If this fingertip is important to you, eventually it can expand. But the size of the head is fixed, right? I don't know which part actually is shrinking down, I don't know. But, but this is a, so there are many different experiments like this. But if you, like the two fingers, the two neighboring fingers, if you sew them together, that's a kind of you know, bad experiment, but you just glue them together, and right? the two fingers move together, you're stimulated together. In that case, the two <coughs> neighboring fingers in the cortex would become fused. In the sense, normally, if I touch finger two, you actually get two, right? If I touch finger one, you actually get one, right? They are in bed with each other. But if you glue them together, they use them together, after some time, you test them again, you can, you can spin with one finger, it will actually both the two neighboring fingers. So that means even for adult uh, cortex, if you play piano every day, I'm sure something happens. <laughs> something happens in the cortex. So this is sort of a uh, big, big possible way of So there are there are other things. But I only have to give you some examples. So say, uh, any any questions? Anything unclear? Okay. Thank you.